Hello and welcome to Pure Hangouts. I'm Sophie Seawright. I'm the content editor at Pure London. We're here in Soho today, despite Tube Mageddon, so I'm more grateful than ever to everyone for making it in despite the tube strike. Very much appreciated. We're at uh, WGSN HQ here and we're going to be talking very aptly about trends, specifically how to take uh, trends that you hear um, from wherever you get them from, whether that's blogs or, um, or from WGSN or from Reading Vogue or from looking at the catwalks, or from street style, or wherever you get your trends, and translating that into uh, products that your customers really want to buy from you, and that are going to be bestsellers, not just window dressing, but they're really going to um, shift off the shelves. Just in case you're not aware of what Pure London is, it is a exhibition trade show that takes place in Olympia, London, from the 2nd to the 4th of August this year. If you're a buyer for a fashion retailer, you can come along for free, and there's a link on this page where you can book your ticket, so do join us there. Apart from buying, you can also do lots of learning and networking. Speakers this year are going to include Mulberry, Facebook, uh, Arcadia, Hobbs, got a really great lineup, plus a lot of independent retailers, including Want Her Dress, Silk Fred, and WGSN. So you can catch up with all those guys on site. We highly recommend that you come along. Speaking of which, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our wonderful speakers today. I'm just going to ask um, all three of you to just talk a little bit about yourself, your company, and what your company does. We start from Sarah at the end here. Okay, hello, I'm Sara. I'm the senior editor um, uh, for retail and buying at WGSN. WGSN, um, we basically provide creative solutions, creating commercial solutions for the fashion, lifestyle, and interiors industry. And uh, myself specifically and my team, we track and analyze trends uh, at retail, uh, both regionally and globally as well. Fantastic. And in terms of how you forecast trends, uh, can you just tell me very briefly how you go about doing that? Because then it's a bit of a mysterious How long art. do I have? Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So uh, essentially, in a nutshell, um, every season, so every six months, uh, the WGSN Global Create Creative Team gets together. Uh, we have offices obviously in London, but New York, LA, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Sydney. And um, we get together and we discuss the main macro trends, we call them macro trends, so the main stories, overriding stories for the season, for the season, for two years, we forecast two years ahead. Okay. Um, and essentially what we do, we look at um, the world of art and design, um, social economic shift, lifestyle changes, so anything that technolo new technologies, new films are coming out. So essentially we're trying to picture the world in two years and how it's going to look like and then once you had that picture in your mind it's easier then to create a design for that world yeah. essentially Perfect. Um, so that's what we do and then after that we have um, our designer our creative team um, starts with color research and then all the way down to silhouette yeah. um, and, and then until the product hits retail it's such an interesting process and it seems like it'd be just so difficult to mm -hmm. do but you almost always get it right which is really strange it's a lot of us you know the magic. strength is in the group really it's yeah. uh, it's it's 200 of us around you know experts from very different walks of life so it's a uh, it's a strength that's that's our strength yeah, really. definitely. emma can you tell me a little bit about yourself and about silk fred oh uh, yeah sure so my name's emma watkinson and i'm the ceo and co-founder of silk fred and silk fred is an online destination for unique fashion. So um, our customer tends to be between 23 and 34, and they're a high street shopper, but they come to us for something that is very wearable and very accessible, but just has something a little bit different about it. Um, everything that we sell is around the 50 pounds price point. Um, we work, and really how our business is powered is, we work with really cool independent brands, give them a platform to sell their products online. And our business is very much governed by data and analytics and helping these brands understand and interpret what's happening with the sales on our platform to help them keep growing, Perfect. growing their business. Such informa useful information for them. And yeah. things are going pretty well for you at the moment, aren't they? Yeah, they're going really well. Like our growth, um, we've grown 230% since last year. And we're selling at the rate of five times what we were for the same period. Um, we beat the entire of 2014 sales before the end of May. Wow. So that's really cool. So it's a new business. It's a startup. It's my first business. And uh, not too shabby. Yeah. I'm really, <laughs> I'm, re I'm really excited about like yeah. how it's grown. Like we've got a great team, which has doubled since January. And fantastic. It's uh, yeah, and, I, and and more than that, like I couldn't, you know, I couldn't be happier for the independent brands that we support. We're the number one source of revenue for 
a growing number of brands who we work with. So fantastic. I'm sure lots of cool. exhibitors in there as well, actually. Carol, Cheer. can you tell me about um, Want Her Dress? Yeah, sure. I bought Want Her Dress a couple of years ago, and um, the founders who'd set it up had very much aimed it at the 18 to 24 demographic, and it was very much celebrity lookalike dresses. Um, and so I set about changing the demographic and the um, and the, the customer base entirely. Um, because what I wanted to do was create something for the mumpreneur, mumpreneurs market. So women who've had children and maybe going back into a corporate workplace, but more likely are setting up a business from home. So they have um, they need versatile wardrobes. Um, they may have lost some confidence through their changes in body shape through having children. Um, so they're needing styling advice as well as um, as, as a versatile wardrobe they don't have an awful lot of money to spend out but when they do spend money they want it to be an investment piece for their mm. wardrobe um, and multifunctional and what kind of price point i know it's a bit of a we're probably yeah but... no we're probably looking um at about 50 pounds to 70 pounds for a dress okay, um, yeah. as a as a guideline on that okay Perfect. And two quite different customer bases and, and looking yeah. for different things, which is perfect because we can talk about how the trends we're about to talk about can be interpreted for those different markets. So now that we know who your customers are and how things are going for both of you, um, Emma, can you tell me how your your personal buying process goes? How do you decide what it is that you're actually going to spend the money on? Um, yeah, for us. So it's really about um, there's two kind of criteria that we put when we're deciding whether we want to work with a brand or not. It's does this look like someone who loves Zara would wear it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Does it look like you can find it in Zara? No. Okay, and if they kind it. of pass that very basic test, then that that for us means that, you know this is a brand that's going to do well with us. In terms of how trends influence how we curate, because um, we're very much you know a curated offering, it's you know the benefit of working with independent brands is that they're so agile, mm. like they're so on the pulse of um, what's happening, what people are loving, and they're really in sync with it, whereas sometimes the bigger retailers can be a bit slower to move to that. Um, the independent brands, like they kind of, they've kind of sussed maybe what is cool, maybe like a, maybe like a year, a year kind of ahead of the, mm. of the bigger, bigger kind of outfits. Um, so for us, we can see like a lot of like main trends coming kind through them, coming yeah. coming through like their collections and um, but for us you know it's a bit of you know can we how can we like pre present like a differentiated offering yeah. but then also how can we like take advantage of the macro trends and make sure that we're covered in all aspects so you know we were talking before the hangout about like the 70s trend so for us it's you know let's make sure we've got enough stuff yeah. to be able to tell a 70s story because yeah. we know that our customers you know we don't just want to be a destination for them to like find the odd thing like we want them to come and buy their whole buy wardrobe, wardrobe with us yeah. so it is important to to be able to reference the trends in in the curation in that and way how do you check when you when you're buying and um, when you're presented with a lot of pieces that you may or may not buy uh, how do you sort of whittle that down i know that you use customer feedback quite a lot but what's what's the kind of process for you there so for us it's all about um the power of an image. Mm. So when it's photographed, I'm um, seeing so, you know, there's lots of products that we love. I mean, sometimes we love stuff and the customers don't love it as much. So for us, it's really about a process of testing and we test everything. Mm. So for us, we get, um, we tend to do like a, a very short order on stuff like minimum, we get like the brands to produce like very minimum, like very small quantities. And then, um, we put the image out there into online marketing. We run some tests. We also have some algorithms um, that run alongside that too. And then based on the data and the results, if it's kind of ticking the boxes, you know, is it getting um, X amount of clicks with an X amount of views? Um, what's the cost per click across the item? All these different sort of tests that we put a product through, if it starts passing, we think, okay, well, this can be something we can yeah. like sell thousands of or hundreds of or maybe only 50. Yeah. So that tends and then that tends to influence, you know, the reorder that then we sure. that we then put in. And a lot of what we do is predicated on previous season learnings yeah. as well. So, OK, well, let's bring back those core styles, but maybe let's do them in like it's like play suits last year were like really big for us. So we were like, right, well, let's have more play suits in lots of different prints, lots of different colors. Yeah. We know that print on black or print on dark colors works better than any other combination of prints. So let's just make sure that we've got a color on black yeah. across all of I'll those colors. I'll ask you a little more about that use of previous seasons later. <laughs> Carol, how does sure. your buying process work? How do you, you whittle it down from yeah. all the trends you're presented with or items you're presented with? It, 
it, to me, it's about customer feedback. Mm. It's also about um, the WGSN um, trend forecast, which I think are presented really well, um, and looking at those macro trends. Um, it's also trying to engage the customers in terms of the customer feedback on social media and see what they're actually looking for, um, getting engaged with Facebook groups. I do an awful lot of um, networking and presenting as well, so I'm going out meeting our customers um, as well as working on an online basis because I fully support the data analytics and think it's a great way of working, um, but there's nothing like getting out there and actually getting that customer feedback face to face and getting a sense of, of what's going to work going forward. Definitely. Okay, that's really interesting. Sarah, could you share with us the autumn winter trends for this season? And I'm going, then going to ask our two retailers to, to kind of share how they would whittle that down and choose some, choose some products that are great for their customers. Sure. Fire away, Sarah. I'll give so you a wave when you've run out of time. For uh, autumn, winter 15, 16, again, it's about the 70s. We've already started seeing what well, started. They've already like saturated the stores um, this, this spring, summer. But the 70s is definitely one of the key themes. Um, we went to a lot of press previews already, so I'm already talking about high street retailers. So it's not just from the catwalks, but it's for high, from high street retailers. And it's just the 70s, and it kind of looks like it's more of a sophisticated way of doing the 70s, but also you have the whole uh, Studio 54 for party wear deliveries, so around Christmas. Um, they have the more kind of bow, the more heritage, but the 70s is definitely one of the main messages for high street retailers. Um, for more tailoring and contemporary brands, we are expecting 60s, but from the catwalks, there was this kind of retro futuristic um, mm -hmm. interpretation of the 60s coming through, especially with Prada, as one of the main influencers. Um, so that would be good for, um, you know, tailoring and more contemporary brands. Um, and then we've also seen, we're also expecting this kind of Victoriana um, dark romance uh, trend coming through. Again, that's probably more for party wear around Christmas deliveries. And what's important to say is that on the cat was it was really quite austere. We had this really long uh, maxi dresses, maxi um, hemlines and high necks. That is not a super commercial look. It's probably quite gothic. It's almost Edwardian in, a way, in, a, in, a, in terms of references. But it's probably going to translate at retail. I mean, you guys tell me, but it's probably going to translate at retail through, you know, uh, lace dresses and high neck dresses are actually quite important, uh, but just not, you know, not too much. So I think that they are the main trends they were expecting for autumn winter 15, 16. What's in, uh, important to point out as well is that although trends remain really important, um, we are seeing a lot more interest on key items and kind of must-haves. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, your boyfriend jean, your, your culotte. So, um, and also pieces that are more versatile and you can fit into different trends. Um, and that's how people buy, really. You don't really buy into the, the full look, I guess. It's, mm. more, it's more about, you know, uh, using that trend. And what you were saying as well is about updating. Rather than coming, coming up with just completely new silhouettes, it doesn't happen that often. It's more the, about the update, you know. Play suit sell, sold really well for you. Why, why not do it again? Um, so, yeah. In terms of the, the 60s look, could you just expand slightly on that? Because I've seen a lot of 70s. I haven't seen quite so much of the 60s coming through yet. Are there any particular pieces or colours or textures that are going to come with that? Um, so mini dresses, like the kind of mini. And we've seen from the um, the press, uh, the pre-season as well. So pre-season is out already, pre-season. Um, no, sorry. I'm just confusing the season. Now. That was spring, summer 16. Uh, you see, that's, that's when I... Um, uh, we are seeing, uh, so for example, we're, what we are expecting, although again, I don't know if that's massively commercial, but that kind of like kick flare, yeah. um, but also done in a more tailored way. So like um, with blazers and also pastel colors, um, but also that kind of more retro futuristic. So I think mini dress is probably going to be quite a big one in, in, in terms of commercially. Yeah. Um, with a round neck and short sleeves or is yeah, that too literal? Yeah, or, yeah, like that or okay. even, yeah, so we're expecting some of that. Um, and just in terms of like, uh, I, I don't think it's going to be as big as the 70s okay. and I think it's going to be, as, it's going to be more for tailoring maybe, yeah. so it's just mm -hmm. more, uh, yeah, more for tailoring which kind of feels newer. Okay. And to put you on the spot, is there any 70s trend that we've seen in spring, summer that you think is likely to die before autumn, winter? Can we can we wave goodbye to the floppy hat? <laughs> floppy hat is going. Yeah. If it does, then the floppy hat. Is there anything else that you think realistically is not sort of suitable for the autumn? You know, crowd? I mean, there is a lot of 
you know, the flat flat genes are actually a flat shapes are actually a really interesting um, topic because I you wouldn't say they're massively commercial, but still retailers they kind of they need to have them in their collections yeah. because you kind of you can't ignore it. You know, it's so that's going to be an interesting one to see. Like. I think we need to see what happens. It's, it's, it's never going to replace the skin is. It's never going to replace, but it's kind of your, it's your fashion bottom way that you kind of have to have, but you don't buy in, in volume, you mm. kind of have. Yeah. So I think there are these species that, you know, you, you have, but they're more for your kind of press marketing material, mm. you know, to put in your blog and to put on your, but actually they're not necessarily what's going to be make you money to sure. kind of, but you kind of need to have them in your range. Okay, perfect. Emma, let's kick off with you. In terms of bearing in mind your customer and what sells well for you, yeah. and bearing in mind those those kind of trends and ideas that are coming through, what, what do you think is most likely to be flying off your website shelves? Um, yeah, so um, I know what you're saying about the 60s thing. Like, I think we've seen like a lot of success with um, maxi dresses, with collars, things that are very tailored, shirt dresses, mm. I think are going to be really big. For us, they were great in summer. They were great in January. They've been great all summer. Like, I can just see them just continuing to fly. You know, yeah. Like... I think, yeah, shirt dresses and lots of different prints. Um, I think that um, tailored jumpsuits are going to be very good for us. I also think, you know, party dresses with a shorter hemline, like you're saying, with like the 60s, like up a little bit. Kind of away from bodycon and more of an a-line or yeah bodycon bodycon's not been super great for us mm. um in some in some it's been fine like um but yeah a-line has been a-line's yeah. been like the winner and i think i think that will probably continue Definitely we've nice, got lots yeah. of like polar neck like short dresses as well and i think i think they're going to be very strong yeah. and lace yeah we always do really well with lace so and is there anything within any of those themes where you think i'm going to buy that it's going to get loads of clicks on the blog it's going to be fantastic for my mm -hmm. marketing material <laughs> but we're not going to sell thousands of it yeah but it tends to be um not necessarily like an item or a silhouette it tends to be um a core silhouette but just in maybe like a crazy color mm -hmm. or yeah. print something that's maybe a bit outlandish like everyone pick everyone clicks on the pink thing but they buy the black one yeah. So that, that tends to be like the pattern that we'll see again and again. Um, we find that the shapes that, especially with online, like flares we found really challenging because skinny, you kind of know what you're getting, yeah. dresses and jumpsuits, that's all kind of straight leg, it's fine. But with flares, like we found them really difficult to sell online. So for us, it's something that we will have because I think you need to have, as you said, Sarah, like a range of options. Because if you just put like all your best sellers there, it's very hard for the customer to differentiate between what they want. You need to show them options so that they can go, I don't want that, I want that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, flares will definitely have some of them in, but I don't, you know, we, we have found them challenging online. Maybe in store, maybe in like bricks, bricks and mores, they do I think better. Generally, generally, they're probably, it's probably quite uh, a challenge. I don't know so. if the customer is really ready for it yet. Yeah. You know, it takes quite a long time for, for silhouettes to shift. And to be completely honest, I don't think they're ever going to be as successful as the skinny because, no. you know, lifestyle has changed. You want something more practical. You know, it's just like the flares that aren't necessarily the most practical. I do remember wearing them in my late teens. Never mind. <laughs> yeah. um, and kind of trying to walk fast. I'm a really fast walker and trying to walk fast in flares. You just get stuck in your own legs and fall over. It's not. It's not the ideal. wedges. You need really high wedges. Yeah. So, yeah, like, and to walk are. with your legs really far apart. Anyway. Anyone's been walking around <laughs> London in wedges. <laughs> Carol, know, how would you right? how would you interpret those? I know you've got it slightly different clientele, yeah. perhaps even less trend led. But yeah. what um, what themes would you take from them that you think are going to be great in the kind of tailoring and the smart sure. marketplace? The tailoring and the smart side of it is quite important. Um, but again, flares are not really a seller for my uh, for my market group. It's more of a classic look. So a straight trouser, not necessarily a very skinny trouser, but something that's uh, is classic um, and will suit most body shapes as well. Um, and in terms of jackets, again, quite classic tailored shapes um, and dresses, shirt dresses, another one that's great because yeah. it's very versatile um, and shift dresses again, um, sometimes it obviously hides up the tummy occasionally on wrap dresses as well, another good one because they suit a number of different body shapes. So it's, it's, it's classic lines more than um, trend led lines. 
probably doing a bit more trend led in terms of color mm -hmm. again exactly as um, emma's saying there for drawing people in you know show them the pink one and they'll buy the black one and we certainly have that with um, particularly with maxi dresses and stuff like that where we have um, some great lines where the um, the red and the green photograph much better and they'll bring people in but it's the black that will sell yeah. Do you find that a strong colour will sell better or worse than a, a print in a in a stronger colour? If it's a if it's a plain block colour, is that more or less appealing than a than a pattern? My t I, my customer tends to be quite cautious, so it's going to be more on the more on the plain stuff, yeah, um, and then accessorising to add colour and um, and that point of difference. Okay. It really varies on the time of year. Oh, really? Mm. Yeah. How does that vary for you? So you know? summer prints mm. tend to outperform block mm. colours. In winter, yeah, just black everything really. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> black navy. Way. Another thing that I meant to brown as well. Actually. Brown's really, I was, I was brown's really say, good. Yeah, one of the big messages for the season as well yeah. for colour is we're seeing this shift from cool shades to kind of warmer. More neutral. Yeah, yeah, and more like warmer, so brown, but it's not like. You know, if you think brown is like, eh, you know, it's not the best color, but actually there is a really range of like, you know, really warm browns that kind of fitting, working with the 70s, uh, more kind of orangey. So there is a big, that's one of the key messages for that, for this season. Really favor, look like a corpse in gray. <laughs> um, looking at autumn winter on yeah. that theme, last autumn winter, we had some challenging weather conditions. Great for everybody having ice cream, quite shoddy for the retailers. <laughs> How has that affected your, your choices kind of going into this next season, Emma, for kick us off? Well, it actually works to our advantage mm -hmm. um, because we are just natural because we work with smaller brands yeah. and we tend to we tend to operate very much within a fast fashion time schedule. So like our brands um, will tend to drop 20 new styles a month. So and we that means that we end up with like 100 new styles every single week and they'll tend to like design very much on the fly based on what fabrics they can get hold of, what's sitting around and they'll just be like, OK, let's put lunch production tomorrow. Fine. So for us, um, you know, we don't even really start seeing winter drops until November. Okay. We just don't. We just found that that just works for us. I mean. I loved last year because when everyone was like sitting there with their wool coats, like we were still selling bikinis for the Ibiza closing parties. Wow. And we were one of the few places that you could still get a really good edit of pool party, beach wear, bikinis, like boho jewelry. And we were just like, you know what? We've not even done a summer sale yet. Let's just keep selling, keep selling. We weren't discounting until October. Mm. So that was great. So I think for us, it actually works better if the weather's a bit more drawn out. Cause I think with online as well, you know, like if I think of how my mum used to shop, you know, in September she'd buy like, you know, a, a winter coat. Mm. And then by October, she was starting to like think about what she'd wear for Christmas. Whereas now with online, because you can just get stuff all the time, people just shop constantly. So it's like, okay, what do I need for this weekend? I'll buy it now. So people aren't thinking that far ahead. They're buying for like their immediate need rather than the planners yeah. The sort of plan, yeah. the plan, the plan buyers yeah, so of what can work be... within that, then that yeah. works pretty well. I, I Caroline, I suspect so, yeah. your sorry, your customer is probably thinking slightly further ahead. Yeah, slightly further ahead. And um, last year, yes, I didn't. I was I bought late last year because I'm not buying. I'm buying on a longer cycle probably than Emma is, and um, I was focus. I focus very much on the party wear range, and I'm very glad that mm. I did. That I didn't get caught out. Um, with you know, that, right, that yeah exactly um, and so I'm focus I'm planning on focusing or I am focusing on the same again this mm -hmm. year but trying to get more on the short orders side rather than onto the um, the longer orders because I think with the global warming and the whole climate change thing I think it's you have to be able to react quicker to, yeah. to changes than more traditional seasons with the traditional seasons don't exist anymore Sounds like you both slightly dodged the bullets. That's <laughs> <laughs> great. Well, we've seen that the as well. Yeah. yeah, because we've seen them, um, um, again, because of this problem, mm. I think the designers as well are, are responding to it, and we've seen a big increase in transitional outerwear. Yeah. So transitional yeah. shapes such as the duster, yeah. um, the, the blanket coat. Um, yeah, they're really good the colors for us. Yeah, yeah, the sleeveless coat. Because they mitigate that risk, uh, a lot more uh, and you can layer them with just knitwear so you know they're still out wear but they you can sell them for a longer um yeah. span so basically that's what we're seeing on the catwalks as well and we've got from our catwalk analytics which is basically it, it compares year on year um 
the presence, the numbers of items on a catwalk from one year to the, to the, to the next year, we've seen an increase in the, the blanket coat was something like 180% increase yeah. from uh, autumn, winter 14, 15 to autumn, winter 15, 16. And it's the same for the, the duster was about 98%. So that, that, right. says, yeah. that says a lot mm. um, that even designers are really, you know, fur is still yeah. there. Uh, again, fur, you kind of need it in your range. Again, it's, yeah. your, it's your window piece, it's your, for your marketing material, but it's on transitional outerwear that even designers are really... Let's busy. hope we don't have an early ice age. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed, eh? Um, so both of you guys sell largely online. And I was just wondering whether there's any particular difference from buying um, products for the high street or bricks and mortar than there is for online. You touched briefly there on, on flares and the fact that if you've got um, a silhouette which customers perhaps aren't already used to, you might struggle with it online perhaps. But is there any other differences in, in buying for the online crowd, do you think? In the sense that, um, I mean, there's pros and cons to it. The pros being you can kind of take huge amounts of data and break it down in a way that you can really make smart decisions for the next season because sometimes what the customers say they like is totally different to what they actually end up buying. Mm. Um, the only thing that I would say that maybe the thing that at least I miss um, is you don't necessarily get like the whole user journey online because it's, it's quite hard like with tracking technology and whatever like we're finding that you know we'll advertise something on facebook and then people will look at it as look at us on instagram and then they'll click they'll open an email and then they'll go through like twitter to buy something yeah. mm -hmm. like how do we how do we understand like our roi on each of the channels if people are engaging with us not, which is great because that's all what our strategy is geared to right but it does mean that we miss that whereas when you have someone walk in your store like when i used to work in bricks and mortar you know we would train the sales assistants to watch what people picked up what did they say in the changing rooms what were they talking about you know and zara have very much been you know as like one of the main as the market leader have you know, very much been you know even though they've got all this technology every week they speak to their store managers and say what was said in the changing room what did people pick up what did they try on if they didn't try it on get it out the store what got tried on if it didn't get bought like why not didn't it convert maybe let's change it like they're very very reactive to what happens in store mm -hmm. as well as online mm -hmm. so i think i think the difference in in terms of buying um from my experience is that when i worked in bricks and mortar we bought for the customer that walked in the door um, whereas with online, like we're selling globally to a huge amount of people. So you're kind of trying to find the best product for the most amount of people. Whereas when you were buying for bricks and mortar, you'd, ha you'd actually have some, like an actual, per you'd have an actual person in mind when you bought it. Like, oh, they like that. And they wear a size 12 and they, yeah. and the benefit of online is that you can get a bigger set of data and, you know, the overheads are, are less. And I do, I do. Qualitative analysis is much easier, isn't it, with online? Whereas qualitative analysis yeah, is I quite mean, difficult. Yeah, I mean, I know which one I love more, but I can see, I can yeah. see, ben I can see benefits to both. Carol, what are your thoughts on that? Um, the whatever, I, whatever it's whether it's online or offline, it's keeping the range tight and having the ideal customer in mind. And as Emma said, you know, it's very easy to have that customer profile um, when you're when you're actually in store and that's why going out and meeting people helps me assess ex exactly what people need and what they're looking for um and so it's just having my target customer in 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 mind when i when i'm buying and in terms of the differences with bricks and mortar it's to me it's it's they're very similar in the sense that you can get carried away with having too much of a of a range yeah. you've got a physical um restriction when you've actually got a shop as to how much you can get in the shop whereas if you've got a warehouse you can <laughs> the temptation is you can have more of a magpie effect but um and also because you're unlimited with how many items you can actually put on photograph and get on on up on the website mm. but to me it's about having that range tight and showing the customer yeah. taking them through that journey mm -hmm. as to what what's going to work for them fantastic that's really interesting and in terms of um sticking with the the online side of things i just wanted a quick tip for our viewers in terms of how you use the online sphere to sort of pick up ideas and inspiration is there anything in particular that you really love um any sort of any blogs or tumblr links or um any websites that you really enjoy referring to when you're thinking about the coming season um I tend to work with with bloggers directly, okay. so um, I've actually got a relationship with a number of bloggers, and so I'm looking at what they're looking at as well and getting their input. Um, and um, 
apart from that, I am just, I'm, obviously I'm looking at what the competitors are doing yeah. as well, but it's also sounding out on some of the blogging networks as well mm. uh, as to what's what they think is going to be big, but it also has to work for my market mm. as well. So it's, it's I'm looking for a, a kind of a toned down effect, yeah, if you no, like. absolutely. And to ask a really obvious question, how did you create those relationships with those bloggers? Did you find the number and call them? Was that how that, that relationship started or no, how does no, it work? No, no. I've, I've, I've co-sponsored a blogger festival last okay. year um, and then I attended a few more blogger events. So I built up the relationships that mm. way. Um, I followed them on Twitter and built up the, the conversations mm -hmm. and the engagement with them on Twitter. And one of the things I did last year was I um, I ran the Women Are Best Awards um, and had six categories, one of which was Best Blogger. And so I got engaged with a number of them that that's way awesome. as well. So I'm now working with one of them on collaborative projects. Oh, I see. That's lots of interesting ideas there. And Emma, how do you use the online sphere for inspiration? Um, so anything where you can um, get a sense of engagement. So like Instagram, we mm. love because it's a visual platform, which what suits us because, you know, we sell brands that no one's really heard of. Yeah. Um, so no one's really like searching and we're small too, right? So like no one's really searching for us, all those brands. But if we have something that's like very visually powerful, we've got a way of getting it in front of people. So for us, if we look at, you know, what people are engaging with on Instagram um, and also we, we've always had the kind of philosophy of using our social media as a shop floor. So like we talk to our customers like they're our friends mm -hmm. and it's about, you know, in our comment section, you know, on our, on our Facebook post, we'll have an average of like 300 comments. I think the most comments we ever had was like a thousand. And what people do is they start asking questions to us and then our other customers start answering them on our behalf. And then you get this kind of whole like, like forum happening like underneath a photo. Mm -hmm. So we listen to that loads and loads like you know do you are you planning to bring this out again you know will you do it in a size 14 um are you going to put it in this color and like we take and we listen to that and we're very attuned to it and you know also i'm trying to work towards making our customer service team into very much a like a like almost like a profit center where you know that not only are they there to like get people through like their orders and all like the boring nitty-gritty of just online admin mm. but also helping them you know f help customers like find exchanges or alternatives or showing them like new things and building up relationships with them. So for us, it's engagement through um, visual channels like Tumblr, Instagram, getting inspiration, looking at what people are really responding to. And then also through through our own channels as well and just 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 listen to what people are yeah. saying. Oh, that's really interesting. We've ever run because this has been so interesting, but we're gonna, <laughs> I'm going to ask Sarah now for your input, both on that question. So how um, you at WGSN use social and, um, and online, because I know you've got loads of really great ideas there. And then I'm going to ask you to whistle through uh, the spring summer trends for next year. Sure. OK. Well, it's very similar to what Emma said as well. We have like obviously uh, Instagram. We look at Instagram, Pinterest, Tumblrs of like key style influencers. Um, we look at editorials, um, we look at, obviously editor, we've got a magazine, we actually still buy the magazines, but online we look at, you know, um, sites like um, Fashion Gone Rogue or yeah. Fashion Beans, they kind of mm -hmm. aggregate the content for you. And for my particular report, so I work for kind of buyer's report, so I work, I work a, a year ahead product is in the store, so it's still a prediction. Mm -hmm. And for those, it's really the key is to find that balance of newness and commerciality so mm -hmm. really you kind of need, need to like something it has to fit fresh but at the same time it has to sell because mm -hmm. that's what would be that's the point yeah that's the point <laughs> um in terms of uh spring summer 16 uh okay so the 70s are still going to be there a little bit but um more though kind of that's always mm -hmm. kind of that for for um summer but we are seeing a lot of kind of just very feminine, more femininity, more focus on the waist. We're seeing that coming through floral prints again. But we've got some really good um, macro trends for that season, mm -hmm. very commercial. Uh, we've got soft pop, which is kind of about retro, a retro kind of look, but um, done on contemporary shapes. Pink is really, really key for that. And I know you say it doesn't sell, but again, it's amazing for like press, yeah, and, like when really you put and then we have Ecoactive, which is kind of mixing athleisure with artisans. So it's two like, kind of like big trends mm -hmm. putting together. And then we have Past Modern, um, which again is like kind of bohemian. It's more pastoral prairie with a lot of Broadway Anglais, mm -hmm. lace. We have a lot of, we're expecting a lot of that coming through and to really hit commercially. 
And then we have Deep Summer, which is one of my favorite ones. And it's basically, it's quite glam. It's quite, it's really high summer, but um, you know, you've got the whole bow again, quite long dresses, but done in a darker palette with a lot of like aquatic mm. shades and iridescence. And so it's kind of a little bit more sophisticated. So these are the main messages, the main macro trends that we, we have we at WGSN are expecting for that. Perfect, season. thank you so much. If you go onto the Pure website, you will see that our theme for this summer is Deep Summer. Uh, so you can get some inspirations <laughs> on colors there. You're welcome. Um, you'll also be really pleased to know that all three of our speakers here are joining us at Pure this season, which is great. So you're gonna be able to hear a lot more detail about spring, summer from Sara and um, Emma and Carol are gonna be speaking on different topics to what they've covered today. So we haven't given anything away. Do sign up online as soon as you can. You're also gonna be able to take part in some networking at the show. Sarah on the Monday night is gonna be part of our drinks reception networking session. So you can grill her on some specific topics if you've got anything in mind. Aside from that, thank you so much for joining us and um, I look forward to meeting some of you at Pure in August.